Today, we're going to talk about co-parenting with a narcissist, and we have a very special guest with us. Dr. Michael Kinsey is the founder of the mental health blog, Mindsplain.com, and author of the book, Dreams of Zulgunrua. He received his doctoral degree in clinical psychology from the New School for Social Research, and he is a specialist in the dynamics of personality, intergenerational trauma, and parent-child attachment. In addition to his distinguished background, Dr. Kinsey is in private practice in New York City. I asked him to join us because he has the most effective breakthrough understanding of narcissism I know of. If you want to connect with him, I've put a link to Mindsplain and his social media in the show notes. So without further ado, here is part one of my discussion with Dr. Kinsey on the topic of co-parenting with a narcissist. Welcome to Narcissistic Abuse. We have Dr. Kinsey. It's an honor to have you here today to talk about co-parenting with a narcissist. Our questions on this topic come from our Twitter community. We compiled the audience questions by tweeting a poll and asking the question, what are your biggest co-parenting concerns with a narcissist? 33% said parental alienation. 28% said what to tell my uh, child. 19% said financial abuse. And 19% said triangulation with the narcissist's new partner. So here's the first question. I'm co-parenting with a malignant narcissist who was verbally and physically abusive to me in front of our children. Is it possible that my children risk developing personality disorders from exposure to pathological narcissism? Well, thanks for having me here. First of all, um, this is a really exciting opportunity for me and it's a really difficult topic to address. And, and you know, the first question, certainly not a softball, so, yeah. um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I guess my, my thoughts on this are that, you know, first of all, you know, in, in some ways people are, are quite resilient and in other ways they, they can be pretty fragile. You know, the, the question I think is a challenging one because, you know, children learn first and foremost by what they see and what they observe. Yeah. And I think there's absolutely going to be lasting impacts of trauma in a context where there's emotional and physical abuse. Um, but the question you're asking is is sort of what are, are going to be the kind of long-term developmental impacts of that trauma? Right. That's a hard question to answer because there's so many variables. But uh, I think there are things that people can do to sort of buffer against the, you know, sort of permanent or, or, or arresting of development that can happen as a result of witnessing or, or seeing that kind of abuse. Mm -hmm. um, th the first thing I would say is that creating sort of meaningful narratives around the experiences, not walking away from it, not not silencing it, not being, um, not pretending as if it's not actually happening. That's a really important thing for kids. Yeah. Kids need to know that they are not experiencing an alternate reality from their from their parents. Right. And especially when the parent who is experiencing the abuse is a same sex um, child. So there's a strong identification, say, you know, in the classic example of a husband abusing his wife emotionally or verbally, mm. that, um, that the, the child who's going to be more, most greatly impacted by that is going to be the one who is identified with the, the one who's being abused. Right. Of course, the, you know, there's other problems in sort of continuing the line of, of abusers down the line in, in when the, the observer is identified with the um, abuser. But um, so, so I guess what I would say is, is going back is just sort of validating the experience, mm -hmm. letting the child know that you know, what they saw was really disturbing and that it's not okay what happened and that something is being being done to sort of protect or insulate the, the child. Uh, so one thing I could think of just at a very practical level is, um, like, I know what you saw was really scary. Do you have any questions for me? Mm -hmm. um, have any mm -hmm. feelings about it? And, you know, also for, for younger kids watching for signs of uh, the impact of the abuse in, in play yeah. is also super important. Mm -hmm. So, and, and not silencing the play when it, when it shows up and just sort of say, 
um, and, and speak, staying in the language of the play as well. Uh, so if, uh, if, if toys are fighting, then you can sort of say, oh my gosh, they're fighting. How scary. Things like that. And just sort of really validate that, that the child has seen something that's very hard. Um, cool. Emotional abuse is, is a little bit more abstract and, and kind of harder to sort of pin down um, sort of concrete examples. But the other thing I would say, too, is, is that one of the biggest buffers against personality disorder development mm-hmm. is having some sense of understanding of one's own feelings and the, the feelings of someone else. And I think a theme that we'll probably touch on quite a bit throughout this discussion is the fact that um, narcissists are not devoid of feeling states. In order to really optimally protect kids, we need to help them develop an understanding of who that person is, what their emotional system is like, and give them a context for understanding the behavior. Mm-hmm. And you know this is this is different from condoning the behavior. Right. Um, we can hold intention that the the behavior itself, that the abuse itself, is unacceptable. But if if, if a person is staying in that relationship uh, despite the abuse, there's already a, a way in which the abuse is being condoned. So mm-hmm. at the very least, the child needs to have an understanding of who who the narcissist is, why they're behaving the way they are and how it's possible to still maintain um, a loving understanding of that person, even though they do very bad things. Mm. This is really important because, you know, we, I think you saw yesterday on Twitter, we were talking about gaslighting. Um, and that's, mm-hmm. you know, having your reality invalidated. And um, I think what you brought up is, is important because a lot of times survivors tend to overcompensate. And Mm -hmm. I think that what I see when, 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 when the overcompensation happens is that it feeds in to creating a false reality for the child. Mm -hmm. Down the line, what I've seen is that that can affect their judgment. Um, it, It skews things because good becomes bad and bad becomes good. Absolutely. Yeah. And that can become very problematic, but, I want to go over to question two because it gets a little bit deeper into this. I hope it's not, well, it is probably a hardball question and it's, I am a survivor. That's, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> it says, I'm a survivor of domestic abuse and the atmosphere between my adult children and narcissist X is cult-like. Mm-hmm. The children participated in the abuse when they were younger and refused to have contact with me today. I've never met my grandchildren. Why does my narcissistic ex have such a hold on our children when they know he abused me? Mm. That's a tricky one. Yeah, and and you know what? I mean, I think it's it's much easier to understand intellectually than it is emotionally. You know, I I, I think maybe there's, I don't know, there's any number of disclaimers that we should probably put out there before attempting to tackle these. I think any time you try to, um, put forth problem solving strategies or easy ways of understanding these kinds of things, it, it can almost invalidate the, the difficulty of the situation. And, mm-hmm. you know, when you have um, children that you've, you've nurtured and, and you love with, with all of your heart and in some ways built your life around, uh, there's almost, there's, it's almost impossible to come up with some emotional or sort of visceral understanding of the situation and, and and really kind of um, grappling with that. It's it's so difficult to do. You know, there. I think it does help to have some context. And the, the context that I, w- I would give people who are alienated from their children or who are caught up in, in the, the narcissist version of reality, I think what you have to understand is that the, is the nature of the, the narcissist defensive structure. And we're mainly talking about splitting, projective identification, and these are kind of um, jargony terms, but splitting basically means that the world to a narcissist is, and, and other borderline personality structures is divided into good and bad. Mm-hmm. And the narcissist is to distance him or herself from the bad as much as possible. Um, there's intense, profound disgust for the bad. 
And the bad all, always has to be outside of the narcissistic personality. Mm. That means that there are scapegoats. It means that there are demons, there are devils. There are people who are completely unworthy of association. Mm -hmm. um, and it goes back to sort of what I was talking about before about how um, an identification often develops, especially with the same sex parent right. and same sex parent is a narcissist. Then um, there's a tendency to emulate that way of dealing with problems and difficulties um, right. and emotions. And so functionally, what this means is that the the bad that exists in everyone that and especially exists in the narcissist is displaced or it's placed into uh, the other parent mm. um, and usually these are things especially that were like vulnerability weakness unworthiness you mentioned in another you mentioned in another discussion we had on this topic um you mentioned tenderness tenderness absolutely yeah yeah even, even really positive things too can be um can be disowned in that way and you described it in such an interesting way you you didn't call it parental alienation at all you described it as being exiled from the narcissist child dyad i thought that was really interesting yeah so the the what being within the dyad is obviously a very coveted place you know with both of our parents there's such a deep need to be loved and accepted and if a if a child is forced to choose you know there's they might choose um the person that they feel they're most like or they'll also choose the person who they feel is is safer um or is is the more desirable one to to follow and in the case of the the type of scenario you're discussing it's it's really it's a matter of survival being in the in group of the narcissist is so essential to survival that's really true and i think it's a great answer i guess all of these questions i have for you are kind of hardball <laughs> so i hope you're ready for question three and it's about um, well you know these are in some ways i was i was observing your twitter yesterday and there's so much uh Kind of terminology within this community yeah, yeah. that to me, and I and I find it fascinating. So, the the softball questions aren't aren't going to help anyone, and and hopefully there's uh, something in there that will be of of use to people. And I think we were also talking yesterday about how, um, in some ways, these are going to be overgeneralized answers. Right? Yeah. There's so many uh, nuances and variables and double binds that are built into these kind of dynamics. If if something I say just doesn't fit or it, it, it seems like I'm oversimplifying things, it's because I am. What I encourage people to do is, you know, I'm I'm available online. You can you can reach out to me, you can touch base with me. Additional information is is available on mindsplain.com. Um, I just released a children's book. I think you um, highlighted in the beginning that the deals with some of these issues of, of parent child attachment. I, I warmly recommend it. And I'm going to put a link to it in the show notes, but let me get into question three. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, you, 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 you got to stop me from these preambles. You got to cut me off. <laughs> you ready? <laughs> yeah. I am being triangulated by my ex narcissist, new partner. They're telling our children that the new partner is a better parent because they are carefree well, I have been battling anxiety and depression. Ultimately, they want the children to move in with them. In your opinion, what is the best course of action for someone in my situation? I think there's the long, there's the short view and there's the long view here. Short-term view can be pretty discouraging. Uh, the kids may be believing it. They may be sort of acting um, in line with what the, the alienating or, or the narcissistic parent um, is sort of feeding them. But the thing to keep in mind with narcissistic, narcissistic people is that um, if you have now in a strange relationship with, with them, you're one of many people. Mm -hmm. um, the hallmark of, of narcissistic personality disorder anyway is that there's chronically strained relationships. Yeah, And there's a reason for this is that everyone ultimately has a fall from grace with a narcissist yeah that's so true and and if you if you uh if you cow and you ingratiate yourself 
back into favor, things can continue on peacefully, but it will always happen. People will always see through uh, the facade at some point, maybe at first just for, for a few moments, um, maybe maybe there will be a prolonged extra, uh, estrangement that develops between the narcissist and, and the kids, but there will always be an opportunity. And so what I would what I would advise people is to create a very welcoming, open, and accepting, non-contentious environment for the kids to return to. And, and in, in many ways, that's the best you can do. You stay yeah. above the fray. You don't comment on it. You don't respond to it. You speak to the kids. You don't speak to the narcissist through the kids. You yeah. speak to the kids and you say, it really hurts that it feels that that it feels that way to you, that, that this other parent is better, but I'm your mother or I'm your father and I'm always here for you. You can always come to me. That wraps up part one of our interview with Dr. Michael Kinsey, author of the book, Dreams of Zulgunwa. Now it's your turn. Are you co-parenting with a narcissist? What challenges are you facing? And what strategies have worked for you? Please share your take in the comments section. For more information on this topic, you can follow Dr. Kinsey on Twitter at Mindsplain or visit his blog, Mindsplain.com. He'll be back again next week for part two of co-parenting with a narcissist. So please hit the subscribe button and the little bell to receive a notification as soon as the video is uploaded. You can also find the print version of this interview on our website, NarcissisticAbuseRehab.com. Guys, that's it for now. Be good to yourself, and we'll talk again soon.